Okay, it looks like uh, most have joined. We'll let folks join, but in the interest of time and making sure we can fit all this content in, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for joining Bank Policy Institute's Bank Regulation 101 this morning. As you know, Bank Policy Institute is a research and advocacy organization that represents uh, the leading banks in the United States. Joining me this morning, I have our uh, CEO and President Greg Baer and our Executive Vice President and General Counsel John Court. Uh, before I turn it over to John Court for the first part of the presentation, just a couple announcements to make. I just want to note for you all that this is being recorded as a resource for you guys to access on YouTube and our uh, BPI resource page for later. Um, also, we have Q&A available in the Zoom webinar function. There's a Q&A chat at the bottom. Um, and not to worry, all of the Q&A is anonymous, so no worries there. Uh, John and Greg, I will, uh, feel f I will interrupt you guys if any questions pop up during your, during your segments, um, just to make sure we get everything answered. And we'll save some time at the end for any remaining questions or thoughts. Uh, and with that, John, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Sarah, and welcome, everyone. We're happy to provide this, um, this webinar for you. Today, we're covering um, our series of Banking Regulation 101. Um, this is usually a multi-hour session that we do in person on the Hill, but we're obviously doing it uh, through a webinar uh, now due to COVID. Today, we are just going to cover part one of that multi-hour um, seminar, um, and so we're just going to run, I think, for 60 minutes of presentation. I think we've got a little bit of time built in at the back end. Uh, if we run over or if there are questions. Um, but we just we're, we're going to cover um, the basics, sort of how banks are structured and how the uh, regulatory agencies provide oversight. We've uh, structured the, the, um, today's discussion basically by introducing you to this topic uh, through eight core concepts. And I think I'm going to cover core concepts one through five, and then Greg's going to cover six, seven, and eight. Um, this is designed to be pretty high level and basic, I will admit. Um, we, our intention is to give you a basic understanding of how our banking system in the U.S. is governed by, this, by the statutory and regulatory framework, and also how they're supervised by the regulatory agencies. We'll obviously do our best to make this interesting, um, and we'll try to highlight uh, parts of the framework that are getting the most attention from policymakers, so we'll try to make this as current and topical as possible, including, in particular, the role of fintechs and big tech, which are trying to act more and more like banks. Uh, we can go to the next page. Oh, sorry, that was the, yeah, there we go. Uh, core concept one, maybe the next page. What is a bank? Um, so here, um, you know, there, there are many different definitions of what a bank is, but this is actually critical because people will talk about banks and some people will say they are banks, um, but, 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 and so that's more just a common term, but, but under the law, uh, a bank, um, and it varies a little bit under the, the federal and the state statutory regimes, but the, but the bottom line is, is that a bank is generally regarded as an entity that takes deposits, makes loans, and pays checks or transacts payments. Um, and those three sort of core activities will come up again and again, particularly when we talk about the context of big tech and fintech. Um, the U.S. bank regulatory framework um, obviously takes its primary point of, of uh, focus on the first of these functions, which is deposit taking. And so as a, as a general matter, any business entity or any entity that wants to accept deposits in the US must be chartered and licensed as a bank. In fact, it can be a criminal violation of both federal and state law to take deposits without a proper license. Um, so that core licensing requirement and that criminal prohibition against taking deposits without, without a license, that's, that's unique to the deposit taking function. That's not true of lending or payments activities. Um, those activities can be conducted, if they're, if they're conducted without deposit taking, um, then they would just be subject to a state lending or money transmitter laws or state lending license or money transmitter licensing requirements. You do not need a banking license if all you wanna do is payments or lending. Um, thus, for example, um, the following, uh, it's worth noting the following entities are not banks, right? So PayPal and Venmo and other types of payment processors, those are not banks. Those are, however, typically required to license under state law as money transmitters. Um, Quicken Loans and other types of kind of online lending companies that, that, that make loans but don't take deposits, those are not banks. We have Lending Club here listed too, and we say that's, that's uh, 
that, that that's not a bank. But actually, Lending Club, I need to update this slide. Lending Club actually last year announced that it was buying an existing insured depository institution or buying a real bank. Um, and I think that application has been approved. So, so actually, Lending Club now is um, owns a bank and therefore sort of is regarded and regulated as a bank. Um, the other types of entities that are not banks are money market uh, funds and, and other types of mutual funds. Um, those operate pursuant to, this, to the US securities laws and requirements to register as funds. Money market mutual funds in particular, they kind of look like banks because they offer what looks like a deposit product, right? They offer you a, a product and it's always at par of $1 is the value and it earns interest. So it looks like a deposit because you can withdraw it pretty easily, um, but, but it's technically not. Um, it, this all is a little bit of confusing, but that's the point of going through these slides today to try, try to make it um, a little more understandable. If we go to the next slide. So what are the consequences of being a bank? Well, there are benefits and there are costs is the bottom line. On the benefit side, um, it gives banks, banks have access to cheap and widely available funding in the form of deposits. There's really no cheaper funding sources in the economy uh, other than bank deposits, right? And that's because bank deposits have various features that are, that are attractive. It's short duration with the ability to withdraw. Um, the money, sometimes on demand, right? Sometimes some deposits are time deposits, but a lot of deposits are just, um, you, you can withdraw them on demand. So these are essentially cash loans to a bank by its customers, uh, again, payable on, on demand. Um, what, what makes them so cheap, not only is that they're, they're of short duration, but they're also, um, they also enjoy protection by the federal safety net. Um, and that primarily is, um, the FDIC uh, provides uh, deposit insurance for, for deposits in the U.S. Up to $250,000 is the coverage limit, but through various ways you can uh, exploit that and actually have a million dollar deposit that enjoys full coverage. You just have to move, you just have to split the deposit up between four different banks. Um, um, the banks pay for the deposit insurance. They pay very hefty assessments and the large banks in particular um, after um, Dodd-Frank pay, pay the lion's share of, of deposit insurance, but the federal government stands behind the deposit fund. Um, because, so because the, the funds are guaranteed, banks are able to, to, to not have to pay as much to sort of borrow that money from their customers. Um, they also have um, deposits also benefit from the bank's access to the Federal Reserve's emergency loans or what we call like the discount window. Um, and the key concept there is that, um, you know, a, a huge chunk of the bank's funding, right? What is it funding? It's funding, it's, it's funding the asset side of its balance sheet. So it's funding loans, it's funding investments in high grade securities, government securities. It's funding all of those things with those deposits, which can run very quickly or at least are demandable. Um, so the, the key concept is here is that a huge chunk of the bank's funding um, is supporting these assets on, on the asset side of the balance sheet that are of much longer duration, right? Just think of any kind of loan, like a, a loan to a business as like a three to five year tenor, credit card loans, those types of balances if customers roll them. Um, those things are not things that can be liquidated very quickly in the marketplace if the bank had to sell its assets to meet its depositors, uh, if the depositors all wanted to withdraw. So the discount window is that the Fed allows the bank to bring some of its, its longer duration assets to the Fed, pledge them at the discount window for a cash loan, and then they can use that cash loan to meet any deposit outruns. Um, so that provides a lot of stability for the system. Um, the, also, the benefit of having a bank license is it gives you some operational flexibility and, and uh, simplicity. It preempts some, some other state laws and regulations. In particular, if you're licensed as a bank, you don't need to go then get a state money transmitter license or a state lending license to also engage in those activities. There are also a lot of costs, right? Um, they're, the, the costs are um, threefold, essentially. Limitate, it's very strict limitations on the types of activities that you can conduct and the types of affiliations, corporate affiliations that you're allowed to have. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Also, another major cost is being subject to prudential regulation of the balance sheet and a host of other government and risk, uh, governance and risk management requirements. Um, and then there's also just an ongoing day-to-day uh, -day into eternity uh, relationship with the government via your um, federal bank regulatory agency. And that's, um, so that's supervision and examination um, on a going forward basis. So these costs are really quite large and, and over time seem to be getting bigger and bigger. Um, becoming a bank is not easy. The duties and responsibilities are 
relatively enormous and costly. Um, so po um, so it, it, um, organizations looking to get a banking license really sort of think hard about it. Um, we see today that a lot of fintechs are looking more and more like banks. They're conducting more and more activities that make them look like banks. Um, and so some of them are out there trying to get licenses to be banks. Some are just getting ordinary bank licenses um, and just becoming full banks and subject to, to all the costs and regulations and, 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 and adhering to all the duties and responsibilities. Others are looking around the edges to see what types of sort of bank light charters might be available to them that allow them to engage in some of the activities that they want to, which, which require a license. Um, to, to, to do a full dive into that would be a topic for, for another day and we probably have that on the agenda. If we go to the next slide, um, core concept two, next slide, um, the structure of banking regulation. Okay, basically again here, and this is pretty basic, so I'll try to move quickly, but, but clearly. Um, there are three big ideas here. Deposit taking activities of a banking organization can only take place within specially chartered um, and, and, and licensed form of, of legal entity. And that's what we'll just commonly refer to as the insured depository institution or the IDI. Um, these are banks that have a license to accept deposits, right? So they're not violating criminal prohibitions on that. The deposits are uh, typically insured by the FDIC and the activities of the IDI itself, the licensed bank, have to be limited to banking activities or activities are, that are incidental to banking. Um, second cons the second idea here, the IDI may affiliate with, um, through corporate affiliations with, with companies engaged in a broader range of activities. Um, that can be cl closely related to banking or financial activities. These are all governed under the Federal Bank Holding Company Act. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. But so you have your sort of chartered uh, bank, and then you have all of its affiliates and that entire organization is sort of commonly referred to as a bank holding company and subject to the Bank Holding Company Act. The third uh, big idea is that the IDI cannot affiliate with any companies engaged in commercial activities. Um, and this reflects sort of the longstanding separation of banking and commerce. It really is a key element of the US framework for banks. Um, the ideas here, why, why do we have kind of this framework? Why do we separate banking and commerce? Why do we pay so much attention to the insured depository institution? The idea here is really just to promote the safety and soundness of the bank and to promote the safety and soundness of the US banking system. You know, before 1930, we had banking crises in, these, in this country almost every seven to 10 years. Um, and banking crises, crises could sometimes lead to economic crises. And so the idea is to have a stable banking system supports the real economy and provides, um, pr provides much more stability um, in, in the macro sense. Um, the other ideas are to limit the spread of the federal subsidy and the safety net. We talked a little bit about how banks have access to deposit insurance, which protects their, their deposit customers. We also talked about how banks have access to the Federal Reserve's lender of last resort function. Those, that federal safety net is also sometimes regarded as the federal subsidy. And the idea is that the government is sort of subsidizing the, 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 a, sta a safe and stable banking system through the provision of those two types of, of, of government, um, um, uh, uh, well, the, the, uh, this government safety net. Um, so there's, so, so that should be a heavy, so that the idea is that in exchange for that, there should be you know, banks should honor certain regulations and, and, and commit to do certain things. Um, the, the other idea here is that there, um, through all these regulations and limitations, the government's trying to limit undue concentrations of power and monopolies. And so that's particularly true on the separation of banking and commerce, and also to ensure that business credit is issued in a bona fide way. And also it limits contagion to banks. If there's, um, if certain parts of the commercial side of the economy get into trouble, you don't want to have those uh, commercial um, entities that are getting into trouble be affiliated with a bank because the contagion could spread to the bank. I will tell you a big policy question is whether these limits that we have on mixing banking and commerce, whether those which we've had historically and have served us well, whether we really need to continue those going forward. And so that's a debate that's certainly happening um, in, ac in the academic circles as, as well as on the Hill to some degree. If we go to the next slide, um, this is just designed to give you a visual. So the structure of bank re regulation illustrated. Um, you can see the big circle goes around the entire banking organization or the entire bank holding company. And you see there's a parent holding company at the top. That's typically a shell holding company. Out of that company, they issue typically equity into the marketplace as well as debt funding. But there aren't really any business activities at the holding company level. Um, 
as a result of the statutory and regulatory framework, a lot of the business activities have to be conducted in separate types of legal entities. Each legal entity typically requires a license to engage in those activities and is regulated typically by sort of a federal functional regulator. So here you see the national bank on the left side of the screen. That's where the deposits are accepted. That's typically where the lending is done and the payments activities. Um, and they, that entity might have subsidiaries. This is a highly simplified structure, by the way. Next to it's a broker dealer. That's typically a registered broker dealer under the US securities laws. That's where uh, customers can buy and sell securities. The, the, the banking organization might also serve its corporate customers through debt and equity underwriting activities. There's an investment advisor also registered under the US securities laws regulated by the uh, SEC. Swap dealers typically um, commodities and other types of derivatives activities are conducted in a swap dealer, uh, might be regulated by the CFTC or the SEC, depending on the types of, of underlying end products. And then also uh, an insurance company. Um, again, has to be licensed um, to date, just at the state level. Um, it's worth noting that the bank and the Bank Holding Company Act limitations that we talked about, um, they generally extend overseas too. So for example, just as JP Morgan can't engage in commercial activities in the United States, um, the same is true for JP Morgan operating in Europe and Asia. So these US laws limiting activities, um, they, they apply extraterritorially. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, the next core concept is bank holding company powers and activities. Um, and we'll start with just a little bit of history here. Um, from 1900 to 1956, you saw the emergence of this bank holding company structure that is so common today. Um, but at the time in, in that early period, there was really no restriction or regulation, certainly at the federal level of those, those bank holding companies and their activities, um, other than some Glass-Steagall barriers and some of the affiliate transaction rules. The, the, the bank holding company concept really emerged in this country um, because we had laws at the state and local level that were intended to sort of protect the local bank. So um, in some parts of the country, um, a bank could not open a branch office, could not expand outside of its county. Um, so in some states, each county had one or two banks that serviced the county. Um, over time, some of those restrictions eased, um, but still we didn't get rid of interstate branching restrictions. So uh, it, until you know, a couple of decades ago, and basically so each state had its own banks and those banks couldn't open branches across state lines. This is not obviously how we operate today, but historically we did. And that's what gave rise to the bank holding company. So a single uh, corporate entity, if they wanted to bank, uh, conduct banking operations in more than one state, they had to set up this holding company to own the bank in Pennsylvania, for example, and the bank in Maryland. Um, as we've said over time, those, those um, branching restrictions have eased and now you see, but the bank holding company structure has remained. Um, and it's also partly driven by the fact that the bank can only conduct certain activities today. And so securities activities, insurance activities, those cannot be conducted inside a bank as a general matter. So if, the, if a corporate entity wants to conduct banking and insurance and securities brokerage activities, it needs to do so through the holding company to hold each of the individual subsidiaries. Um, in 1956, the Bank Holding Company Act was enacted. Uh, as we've talked about that, it has a lot of limits on the activities that bank holding companies and their subsidiaries can engage in. I will tell you historically what drove that a little bit is there was a, um, the Transamerica, which was a large insurance conglomerate at the time, was buying up banks in a number uh, of parts of the country. And that gave rise to concerns about concentrations of power um, and also the, uh, the, the, the activities that banks and bank holding companies were engaging in. There was a recognition that this was an emerging growth area and Congress wanted to get their hands around it. In 1970, the Bank Holding Company Act was amended um, to eliminate a one bank holding company loophole, which Basically, if you were a holding company, you only owned one bank, you weren't subject to the Bank Holding Company Act, they got rid of that. Um, and then more recently in 1999, the Graham Leach Bliley Act was enacted, which created a new financial holding company, which is basically a bank holding company, but just a slightly, they put some bells and whistles on it. Um, they call it a financial holding company. We'll talk a little bit about those bells and whistles in a second. Um, and it basically expanded somewhat the, the scope of activities that bank holding companies could engage in. It's also worth noting here that uh, there was a section of the Graham Leach Bliley Act that established a comprehensive privacy and data security framework that applies to all banks and bank holding companies. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, bank holding company powers and activities. 
Um, what are the triggers and the implications of regulation as a bank holding company? So basically what makes a company subject to the Bank Holding Company Act? Basically it's, it's any company that controls a bank is the bottom line. Um, so if you own an insured depository institution or if you otherwise own a bank, um, you're gonna become a bank holding company. Um, the core implications of that are that um, going forward, you need Fed approval both to become a bank holding company, but also to, to acquire any interest in any additional banks or really to engage in any additional um, non-banking activities. Uh, there's a lot of limits on, on all the activities that you can conduct. And, and as we talked about, you're also subject to prudential regulation and supervision of the entire bank holding company. I will tell you that it, as, as time has evolved, um, these bank holding companies, it used to be that maybe they'd own a bank in Pennsylvania and a bank in Florida. And those two banks were operated very separately. And it was just the, the holding company that sort of knitted them together. Um, th that notion of a bank holding company owning a company over which it doesn't really have a lot of operational or managerial control, that, that's all gone. Um, the way the statutory and, and particularly the supervisory framework has evolved is that these organizations really are, uh, they're, they're now subject to consolidated capital liquidity requirements. They're subject to consolidated resolution and comprehensive resolution planning requirements. All of these requirements over time have really started to knit these organizations um, into it from a conglomerate into a single enterprise. So everything is enterprise wide now. Um, there's no far flung, for the most part, there's no far flung random subsidiaries that aren't controlled by the, the corporate parent. And in fact, the capital regime imposes significant penalties if a bank holding company owns only a minority interest in another financial company. Um, the capital requirements that are applied to that investment are, are quite punitive. Um, Going to the next slide, um, bank holding company powers and activities. Um, what is a bank for purposes of the Bank Holding Company Act? Earlier, earlier we talked about what makes you a bank holding company and it's whether or not you own a bank or control a bank. So the next question is, well, what is a bank? Um, it's not just an insured depository institution, um, but it's basically um, any bank that is insured or any bank that both accepts deposits and makes corporate loans. And that's an important statutory definition uh, because it creates a lot of uh, what I'll just characterize maybe as like regulatory arbitrage opportunity. So if you want to engage in banking, but you don't want to become subject to the Bank Holding Company Act, well, you gotta you can't own an insured bank and you got to figure out a way that you're not both accepting deposits and making corporate loans because that will bring you into the Bank Holding Company Act regime. There are some statutory exclusions and I won't spend a lot of time on these. They all have an underlying policy rationale, or at least they did at the time of their enactment. Um, so thrifts are uh, like savings banks are exempt from the Bank Holding Company Act, but of course there is a savings and loan holding company regime that's over time become nearly identical to the bank holding company regime. Credit card banks, certain types of trust companies, trust banks, limited purpose trust banks, edge and agreement, uh, edge, and, edge act and agreement corporations, uh, again, sort of a historical um, uh, entity. Um, and then industrial loan companies, uh, or also called ILCs. These are actually very topical today. Um, we give a hat tip to the Utah Senator who in 1987 ensured that this um, exclusion from the definition of bank was written into the Bank Holding Company Act. Um, the ILCs of the 1980s are not the ILCs allowed today. So it's actually a very different um, situation, but the FDIC only recently began approving deposit insurance applications for new ILCs. And so we are starting to see more and more big tech and FinTech firms mm -hmm. apply for ILCs. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. You, you typically refer to all these excluded entities as non-bank banks. Mm -hmm. um, going to the next slide, um, the powers and the activities, mm -hmm. the, the scope. Um, as a general matter, you know, the, under the Bank Holding Company Act, bank holding companies are permitted to engage in, in the activity of, of, of owning and managing banks. And that's basically it. Everything else is prohibited unless there's an exception. Um, and so the, the key exception is in section four of the Bank Holding Company Act. And it basically says that Bank Holding Companies Act, act Bank Holding Companies may own companies that engage in the activities listed here. And I won't go through all of these, but they're basically, these are activities that, that over time, either as a statutory or a regulatory matter have been determined to be so closely related to banking that it makes sense to have them in a banking organization um, entity. So, um, so over time, these things have developed. This was all up until 1999 um, when the Graham Leach Bliley Act was enacted. Um, but, but generally, you know, in today's terms, uh, 
things that um, are closely related to banking or that are deemed to be financial in nature are allowed within the bank holding company. Um, and so this is what, but, but, but this is what we're talking about when we talk about the general prohibition on mixing banking and commerce. You know, we're talking about commercial activities or basically anything that's not authorized for a bank or a financial holding company. Um, and we will see that many big tech firms and fintech companies will structure themselves in ways that avoids bank holding company supervision, just given its outsized impact on the parent companies and the overall business activities. If we go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit here about um, the expanded activities that Graham Leach Bliley allowed. Um, so um, as I indicated earlier, that the Graham Leach Bliley Act created this new type of bank holding company, which is defined by statute as a financial holding company. But uh, basically a financial holding company, it's just a bank holding company that meets certain uh, requirements. You know, it's well capitalized, it's well managed, and that's according to its uh, well managed status is basically, you know, do its, does its supervisors give it like decent management ratings on its, on its exam reports? And also does it, does the bank holding company, do all of its bank subsidiaries um, have at least a satisfactory community reinvestment act rating? Um, so that's how you become eligible to come an FHC. If you meet those criteria, you basically file a one page form and you become an FHC. Um, um, I will tell you though, if you fall out of some of those criteria over time, if you are an FHC and you no longer are well capitalized or you no longer are well managed, or if your banks no longer have a satisfactory CRA rating, that can jeopardize your FHC status. Um, but for qualifying FHCs, you can ex expand and ex uh, engage in these expanded activities, um, full range of securities underwriting, um, uh, underwriting and dealing activity, insurance, merchant banking, uh, which allows a bank holding company to own up to 100% of the equity of a company that's engaged in commercial activities, but it's only for investment purposes. So the FHC can have no day-to-day -day, uh, operational or management control and the, and the duration of the investment must be limited. Um, under Graham-Leach, um, you can um, also engage in activities that are complementary. That hasn't really been used yet. They, they allow some commodities trading activities as complementary. But in the interest of time, I could dwell on some of this for a second, but in the interest of time, I'm going to try to move on. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, core concept four, prudential regulation. So what does this mean? I've always been sort of confused by this. Prudential regulation, I mean, it's basically regulation intended to um, make the regulated entity uh, act prudently, right? And so that's what you want uh, as a taxpayer uh, and as a citizen, you want your your banks to act prudently. Um, if they act imprudently, we could go back to a day where we had a banking crisis every seven years. And I think we decided we didn't like that. Um, so it's primarily, you know, what does it mean? It's primarily focused on the safety and soundness of the insured depository institution, uh, but also the bank holding company. It applies at both levels. Um, there are different legal regimes. Um, and oftentimes the requirements are more stringent at the IDI level. Um, prudential regulation often is distinguished between the types of market regulation that the SEC and the CFTC do of the securities and the commodities markets. That's an important distinction. Um, but again, the rationale for prudential regulation and banking, why do you want banks to act prudently? Well, you want to protect depositors. You want to protect the FDIC, for which the US government is the backstop, even though the banks pay the assessments. Um, you want to protect the banking system, and you want to limit the moral, moral hazard. Um, because we talked about how the existence of the federal safety net. And the idea is you only want the federal safety net or the federal subsidy to apply to those activities, um, but and to not extend beyond that. You don't want the federal government subsidizing other parts of the economy. Um, the consequences are that, uh, yeah, prudential regulation has a huge impact um, on the economics, design, and management of, of how the banks operate themselves. And the prudential regulations reach is really quite profound, and its ability to um, to, to control, um, for example, credit availability in the economy uh, and and control how. Uh, and to whom financial services uh, can and are provided, all of that is, is really impacted heavily by prudential regulation. At BPI, we do a lot of work studying the prudential framework and its impact on bank behavior uh, from assessing how capital, how the capital framework, including the Fed's stress testing regime, how that impacts the cost and availability of credit to the full range of US borrowers, commercial borrowers, retail borrowers, LMI borrowers, um, we also study things that are much more mundane, like how go governance requirements, which are a part of the prudential framework, how that can impact the ability of, uh, of a bank to properly manage its risk. Um, and a lot of the work that we have is obviously on our website if, if you're interested in more of that. Um, going to the next page, um, 
the safety and soundness framework at a glance. What is it? There's activity restrictions we talked about, capital liquidity rules. Um, those will be addressed in a, a different session. Um, supervision and examination, Greg's going to address this later in this session. There's also governance standards, risk management standards, um, special regimes um, intended to limit the exposure of a bank to any particular borrower. Um, going to the next slide, um, I'm not going to, I see, just looking at the time, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. But rest assured, there, there's section 23A and 23B of the Federal Reserve Act, which you will hear about from time to time. It is a major tool, a major statutory tool to, to promote the prudential regulation. And in a nutshell, what it does is if, if you have that insured depository institution within the bank holding company, these sections of the Federal Reserve Act impose very strict limits on that bank's ability to transact with its affiliates. Um, it, it has limits on the, the amount of money it can lend to its affiliates. It has a lot of limits on the types of transactions that it's even permitted to engage in. Um, there, there are quantitative limits associated with that as well as qualitative limits. So any transactions have to be like fully collateralized. All of those things are designed to protect the bank. Those are sort of very important. I can't overstate the importance of those affiliate transactions restrictions. Um, but just, so I'm gonna go to slide 18. Um, another big piece of the Prudential um, rule book is the Volcker rule, uh, which was added by Dodd-Frank. Again, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through both of these slides, but I think a lot of folks are familiar with the Volcker rule. You know, for, for better or for worse, um, there was a perception um, that bank holding companies and banks should not be engaged in proprietary trading and shouldn't be engaged in a lot of hedge fund or private equity fund type activities. Um, a lot of people will debate whether or not um, it was the right policy response to the great financial crisis. But regardless, the uh, Volcker rule was embedded in the Dodd-Frank Act and the agency spent a lot of time writing a very comprehensive Volcker rule. The first one um, that came out, there was, um, there was concerns about it, um, um, about how you define proprietary trading. What does that mean? Um, you really had to get into the trader's head to figure it out. There were some problems there. There were also problems just about the, the scope and breadth of the rule. So the agencies did a big revamp, sort of a Volcker 2.0. I'm on slide 19 now, the next slide. Um, and here we go through some points about some of the um, adjustments and modifications that they made. Um, going to the next slide, a core concept five, types of banks and their charters. This is pretty boring, I'll admit, so I'll go quickly, but it is important, um, particularly when you start talking about how entities are regulated. So the type of charter you get is very important because it determines to what laws and regulations you are subject. So the OCC, for example, is talking today about offering a, nation, a, a national bank charter, but for fintech firms that maybe don't wanna take deposits and just wanna lend or just wanna do payments. So it's important to understand that that's a variation on the national bank charter, but those chartered entities would not be subject to the full scope of, of regulation and, and statutes that apply to ordinary banks, including things like the Community Reinvestment Act. Um, and so understanding the types of charters and, um, is critical to understand what the duties and obligations that befall the licensee. Um, I'm just gonna go to slide 22. Again, this is just a little schematic. There are different types of charters. Um, there's federal charters, there's state charters. You can get a full bank. Um, you can also now get, um, sort of special purpose bank licenses where, again, you don't do the, the full range. There's also historically, we've had thrifts, which are savings associations, which I won't spend time on because I think they're less and less relevant uh, as time marches on. So going to slide 23, national banks are the primary charter choice, particularly for larger banks or mid-sized banks that wanna operate across state lines. There are benefits of federal preemption that, that make that attractive. Um, just gonna go to the next slide, 24. Um, Again, these are the state charters, which are a lot like the national charters, um, just some slight differences that I won't dwell on here in the interest of time. But going to slide 25, the, this is the non-banks. This is where the FinTech and the big tech entry into banking debate. <coughs> um, th these are relevant facts for that debate. Um, because again, as, as these companies look to do banking activities, they realize they need banking licenses. And if they just go get a regular banking license, they're gonna be subject to the Bank Holding Company Act. They do not want that. As I said, some have opted for that. Those are sort of the exception to the rule. Most of them want to try to find a, a license that allows them to kind of do what they want to do, but doesn't subject them to the full 
uh, banking regulation regime. Um, and so I'm just gonna drop down to the bottom here, the last bullet point, recent entrants into the banking space that are also not banks include um, these institutions I just talked about that the OCC is thinking about chartering for fintech firms, um, but also, um, and there's, this is a very, um, this is an emerging area. There are, there are state chartered special pur purpose depository institutions. The, there's a, the sort of the crypto and the fintech lobby has been in state capitals over the last few years, um, urging states to adopt a special type of bank charter um, that would allow these crypto exchange companies and these fintech companies to come in and get this license. It's a special license that would not subject them to the Federal Bank Holding Company Act, but would allow them um, to do certain types of lending or deposit taking, not insured deposit taking, but certain types of depositing, certain types of payments activities. It would allow them to do that and would also set them up perhaps to be able to plug into the Federal Reserve System to maybe have access to the lender of last resort function, which is an extension of the federal safety net, and also have access to the Fed's payment systems rails. So that's a place where a lot of attention is focused these days. Um, also, I, I, for one more minute, I'll just mention ILCs. We, we talked about it a little bit earlier. This is also a big area where FinTech and ben, Big Tech see an opportunity to get a license that will allow them to, to, to engage in banking activities, but again, not be subject to the full fe federal overlay, regulatory and statutory overlay. Um, ILCs are um, sort of a creature of state law. I think there's seven or, state, seven or eight states that offer them. An ILC can do absolutely everything a bank can do, Historically, this wasn't true, but over time, the states have modified these ILC licenses to allow an ILC to do absolutely everything an ordinary bank can do, uh, with one exception, which is um, if you're a large ILC, you cannot offer, currently, you cannot offer demand deposits, so basically like checking accounts, um, but you can offer savings deposits. And um, there was an article in, um, I think, Bloomberg or Reuters yesterday that um, PayPal has said at their Investor Day conference that they're going to start offering savings deposit pro products to their customers. Um, and I think probably what that means is they're gonna apply for an ILC charter um, because that will allow them to offer that type of deposit product, not a checking or a demand deposit, but again, a savings deposit. Um, the, I, the FDIC has recently started approving deposit insurance applications for ILC applicants. That for like 13 years, they weren't doing that. Um, um, and, and they've approved a couple and Nelnet is one, they're a student loan company, Square is another, most of us know Square, it's a big payments company. Um, there's another application that's pending that that really implicates um, major policy issues. And that's an application by Rakuten, which is known as the Japanese Amazon. They bought Ebates in the US a couple of years ago. They, they have a bank in Japan, but they want a bank in the US too. This would be really seismic if it's approved. Um, it would be um, basically big tech's first full-fledged banking license and the FDIC can approve it. Um, and the Fed has no role and nobody else has any role. Um, that application has been filed and withdrawn I think filed three times and withdrawn three or with filed three times, withdrawn twice. I think the third time might be the charm for them. So you might see that approval coming soon. So I apologize for racing through that. I'm over my time. We're at core concept six and I will turn this to my colleague, Greg Bear. Hey John, thank you very much. Uh, Whitney needs to turn on my video because I am blocked from doing it. Although I'm much better orally. Um, okay. I think you can see me now. So hello, everybody. Um, trying to make this fun, uh, but elemental. Uh, please do uh, lob in any questions you have. I can't say there are no stupid questions, but at, le at least in this case, there are anonymous questions. So um, I'll get through this pretty briskly and try to leave a little time at the end. So we're gonna start with the bank regulators. Uh, so Whitley, look, oh, there we go. Okay, um, really this, the structural regulation to some extent mirrors the types of charters that John was talking about. I'll just give you a very brief history lesson which should give you a little perspective here. Um, you know, back in the 19th century, most state, most, all banks really were state banks, it was known as the wildcat banking era. era. The states kind of liked having state banks. Uh, they controlled economic growth. There was also tax benefits. And so that was sort of a state prerogative. Uh, then in the Lincoln administration, it was, it was actually relevant in the Lincoln administration, you had the National Bank Act passed in 1864, um, and we had for the first time national banks. There began a now century long fight between the state's governments and the federal government over who gets the charters um, and the benefits that come with that. Uh, 
It's why we have what's known as the dual banking system, because in two senses, uh, there are two, and then they frequently fight. Um, and so we still have now uh, state charters um, where you have a state regulator, but also now a federal regulator. And you can basically pick whether you want that regulator to be the FDIC or the Federal Reserve. And then you have a national charter where your regulator at the bank level is the office of the Comptroller of the currency. Back in 1864, the OCC actually had currency responsibilities. It's now just a bank regulator, but hence the very odd name. Um, so, you know, over the years, it's sort of ebbed and flowed, you know, whether, you know, most banks would prefer a state versus a federal charter. Uh, states have attempted to penalize the use of a national charter, which has led to a whole lot of jurisprudence around that. Um, and even to this day, there you know, continues to be a struggle. Generally, the smallest banks tend to be state banks um, and um, generally tend to favor the FDIC as their regulator. Um, the largest banks, particularly those with a national franchise in retail um, because of preemption, the ability to preempt state laws, tend to be national banks. But some of the very largest banks that are not retail banks, uh, so think Goldman Sachs, Bank of New York Mellon, uh, State Street are state member banks. Uh, so they are also state banks, but regulated by the Federal Reserve. And sort of all this is continually in play, which is, which is kind of fun. Um, that was sort of the state of play bank to bank um, for a long time. But then over time, banks were permitted to affiliate with non-banks. Um, so this brought up the new question, okay, well, if a bank has an affiliate that isn't a bank, who regulates that? Uh, long story, but basically the decision was the Federal Reserve will regulate that. So it will regulate a sister company, but then also the parent company also known as a bank holding company because it holds a bank, but it also holds other things. If all it holds is a bank, you don't really need it, but it holds a bank. It might hold a broker dealer, a securities affiliate, other types of affiliates as well. So again, for a long time, the notion was, okay, well, the Fed will be the holding company supervisor and it'll have some responsibility for the non-bank affiliates, but really those non-bank affiliates will be um, functionally regulated. So if it's a securities affiliate, the SEC is really gonna be the regulator. The, if it's a commodities, uh, you know, com commission, future commission merchant or a commodities firm, the CFTC will be its primary regulator. Um, and then sort of, you know, a light, relatively light touch by the Fed. Um, all of that changed after the global financial crisis um, as those affiliates were seen as posing systemic risk um, and therefore they needed much more intensive supervision and examination. So at that point, the Fed really stepped in, imposed capital and liquidity requirements, really the same on the non-bank affiliate as on the bank, um, sort of erasing the distinction really between having a bank affiliate, which traditionally had been more heavily regulated because it's the one that issues the federally insured deposits that the taxpayer backs, whereas less supervision regulation of the non-bank affiliate because you know it can just fail and without any cost to the taxpayer. Again, post-global financial crisis, the there was a perception you know we can debate, but the the non-bank affiliates pose just as much risk to the taxpayer as the bank affiliates. All the Fed capital liquidity requirements would apply to banks should, should apply to holding companies. Um, and to their non-bank subsidiaries. And hence the Fed became the predominant regulator. Um, and you know, if you look at it now, the prudential regulations imposed by the Fed on a broker dealer are much more significant for its you know, activities and profitability than any market regulation imposed by the SEC, which is a real sea change. Um, I think that covers most of this slide. Again, you know, part of being the regulator is implementing the statutes, examining, enforcing laws and regulations. Okay, so again, here's just a quick overview of, I've got a little bit of a lag on the pages here. Sorry, I overshot. Now I'm going the other way. There we go. Um, so this is just a listing you can use it in the future. Um, you know, in addition to the the Fed is the holding company regulator and the state member bank regulator. The OCC, again, is the national bank regulator. The FDIC is the regulator for state non-member banks, non-member being not a, not a member of the Federal Reserve System, um, in addition to the state also being a regulator. Um, we covered the SEC. FinCEN is basically the a, the regu a regulator for any money laundering. This Consumer Financial Protection Bureau created in Dodd-Frank uh, was, was, I think, supposed to be 
the sole regulator for consumer financial protection issues is still a regulator, but uh, the bank regulators have actually clawed back a lot of that authority to themselves. NCUA, obviously for credit unions, um, and the FSOC, I think, is beyond the scope of today's presentation. Okay. So the Fed uh, created in 1913 in the Federal Reserve Act, um, as we've talked about, um, really takes the holding company and to the extent that there's a state member bank subsidiary that as well. Um, the it's it's interesting, again, over time, and this has changed, but the Fed is now the predominant regulator for foreign banks operating in the United States. I don't have the numbers at the tip of my tongue, but um, you would be shocked at what a large percentage of uh, bank assets in the United States are actually owned by foreign banks or their subsidiaries here, um, you know, both European, Canadian, uh, particularly in capital markets activities. And so the Federal Reserve is their regulator and examiner predominantly. Um, they pose a lot of very difficult and interesting questions about how to treat, for example, a branch of a, say, French bank operating here, where really, you know, the management um, and most of the capital is actually in France, not in the United States. Um, there's also a continuing debate about sort of the efficacy and then the, the appropriate regulatory response to whether that bank should operate a branch here or whether it should be required to establish a whole U.S. subsidiary um, and operate like any other U.S. bank. Again, beyond today's scope, but you should just be aware that this is a major area of regulation and, um, and business. Um, as noted, the uh, OCC, a creation of the Lincoln administration, um, it is, um, its status is always sort of debatable. It is actually a bureau of the, of the United States Treasury. Um, however, it has some aspects of independence um, most notably, it doesn't have to clear its regulations with the Treasury. Uh, it, the, the Comptroller can testify without clearing testimony. I believe its budget, though, is still within the purview of the Treasury. But certainly, the OCC considers itself an independent agency and, and behaves like one. Okay, the FDIC um, really has three roles. It's, it's kind of interesting. Um, first of all, it's an insurance company. Uh, just like any other insurance company in some ways. Uh, it collects premiums and it insures something. Namely, it insures the deposits that banks hold um, below $250,000, so basically your deposits. Um, you know, those do, the, the premiums are supposed to be risk-based. They really aren't. That's another story. But basically, it's an insurance company. It's then also, um, uh, sort of oddly, the examiner for state non-member banks. Um, again, the thousands of small banks that are not regulated by the Fed or the OCC. So that's a completely different job. And then in the event that a bank fails, it's actually the resolver. So it's sort of the bankruptcy court in the event that a bank fails because when banks fail, it's not really a suitable process for a bankruptcy judge for reasons I can get into if anyone cares. Um, so the decision was no, the FDIC is effectively gonna, effectively gonna be the bankruptcy judge. So it manages that whole sort of you know, series of responsibilities, which, you know, sometimes are in a bit of tension, uh, but that sort of adds up to what the FDIC does and makes it sort of an interesting agency. Also, as noted here, after Dodd-Frank um, or after the global financial crisis, um, people were sort of surprised that there was really no way to resolve a large systemically important holding company like Lehman Brothers. Um, you know, there was no way for it to go through an orderly bankruptcy process. The FDIC did not have authority. And so there was a view that if bankruptcy didn't end up, didn't work for somebody like that, a company like that, then the FDIC should have the authority to resolve it. And now the FDIC has added that. So it's not just now the resolver of the bankruptcy court for banks, but also for their parent holding companies, which has created a whole nother sort of legal, legal regime that we can get to in a future version of this class. Okay. Uh, three different forms of oversight, um, one of which is a little bit of a misnomer here. One is regulation, that is the ability to write rules, just the way regulators at the EPA or the Department of Agriculture write rules. The last is enforcement, which is the ability to fine or take other actions against firms if they violate those rules, again, just like any other government agency. The real distinction is the middle one. Um, the agencies always refer to it as supervision. The law actually never refers to supervision, except with regard to the title of the vice chair for supervision at the Fed. <coughs> what the law provides for is examination. Uh, that is examining the books and records in order to ensure that they are in compliance with regulation. Over time, however, and particularly since the global financial crisis, 
examination really has morphed into supervision. It's an important distinction because if I said, I need you to go examine the books and records of uh, Pete's Coffees over there, uh, you'd go, you would think of your task as one thing. If I said, I need you to go over there and supervise Pete's Coffees, uh, Pete's Coffee, you would think of that as a very different thing. Uh, the law really is the former. Um, the fact currently is really the latter um, as the banking agencies um, exercise extraordinary latitude through the process we're about to describe in order to determine how banks are managed and, and run. Again, here's sort of the, whoops, sorry. Um, here's sort of just the org chart. Again, you can save this for later. Um, ben, again, it just shows the Fed with the top tier and then all the other various regulators and where they fit into the org chart. So next slide, thank you. Okay, so this seems like a very narrow topic, but it speaks to a larger one. Um, and it's again, it's what's unique about the regulation of banks as opposed to any other type of company in the United States. Um, it's that most of, the, of the, the mandates to those banks from the government are secret. Um, that, and this comes under the, con, the, the rubric of confidential supervisory information. And it means that as, as regulators examine these banks and tell them, we don't like this process, we do, we do like this process, change this, do that. Uh, we don't like this particular employee, whatever, all that's secret. Um, that's everything from how they manage their vendors to um, you know, their performance under the Fed's stress test for capital adequacy. All of it's secret. It's actually in the views of the agency and no banks had the, the temerity to challenge it, considered a criminal violation to repeat anything that an examiner tells you to do um, and therefore to complain about it as well. Um, so um, it is, a remarkable thing that you as policymakers, as lots of you are, uh, will never see in your career a bank examination. Uh, most people who work at, well, I would say 99% of the people who work at banks have never seen a bank examination uh, because it is considered so secret and important. Um, so again, it, it makes this topic unique among any other regulatory topic in that you don't know the vast amount of what's going on um, and what's driving uh, bank behavior with with regard to the regulatory process. And also I think it's fair to say since 2010, you know, the, the sort of trade-off between regulation and examination slash supervision has changed materially. The agencies now do most of their enforcement secretly through the examination process, not publicly through the process we'll talk about a little bit briefly later. Okay, next. So this is just, yeah, you know, again, you read this at your, at your leisure, but this is a recent, reiteration by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York about just how secret um, they consider the examination process. Okay, next. And more, next. Okay, so now on to examinations. Next, okay. Um, again, Fed at the holding company level, uh, OCC at the national bank level. The CFPB actually was granted um, by the Dodd-Frank Act exclusive authority to examine and enforce the consumer financial protection laws against banks with greater than $10 billion. Um, the theory being that those are the ones that are most significant. Um, and then, you know, for smaller banks, it doesn't really make sense for the, for the CFPB to have an examiner going into a small community bank, especially when the Fed or the FDIC or the OCC is already there and they can just check the consumer boxes along with all the other boxes. Uh, so that made sense. Um, in the event, um, while the CFPB was granted sole examination and enforcement authority, uh, the banking agencies have continued to examine um, and to some extent enforce as if that never happened. Um, I think the animating theory is that they still have safety and soundness authority and that any consumer violation is by definition a safety and soundness problem. So therefore anything that the CFPB can examine as a violation of the consumer financial protection laws, they have equal authority to examine as a, as a safety and soundness problem. So that means that you know, banks are pretty regularly subjected to examination by both. I should also note, maybe I should have mentioned it earlier, um, you know, examination is, is sort of a, an interesting, you know, its evolution has been interesting. Uh, it used to be, particularly when banks were smaller, you know, you'd have a visit from your examiner once a year, and that was probably just a couple of them. Um, now the largest banks have hundreds of on-site examiners. Um, they are under examination every day. 
Um, they're subject to hundreds or maybe thousands of exams per year. Um, you know, regional banks probably have tens to dozens of on-site permanent examinations and are under constant examination. I think mid-sized community banks, you know, probably don't have resident examiners, but are still pretty heavily examined um, over time. I think the other sort of major development over the last few 10 years has been that when it comes to the most important examinations, those regarding capital and liquidity, and I think in the views of the regulators, resolvability, that has really migrated to Washington um, and to head office and more to economists than sort of people trained as examiners in terms of finance. Uh, so I think that's been a real sea change. Okay, next. Also really interesting, uh, kind of fun. Um, the OCC and the Fed now really approach examination quite differently, sort of building on what I was talking about earlier. Um, the OCC in option one tends to delegate much more authority to the onsite exam team uh, on the theory that they know the bank the best um, and can appreciate you know, their business model and how the rules sort of fit to that business model. And again, whether things that make sense for one bank may not make sense for another bank. Um, of course, the, the risk of that is that they get you know, too trusting of management, or as I've seen actually more frequently, too distrusting of management um, and angry at management. So that's sort of the pros and cons there. This, the other approach, which is really the Fed's approach, is an even more centralized model um, where you basically have you know, centralized experts or cross reserve bank experts who go from bank to bank um, and say, well, you're doing it one way, another bank's doing it a different way, we want you to do it the way the other bank's doing. Uh, with less latitude to say, well, no, we actually understand how you operate and you do credit underwriting differently than that other bank. So of course you should have a different process for that. Um, so, you know, either one could work, I think, um, but they are very different approaches. Next, okay. Um, again, I think this is more of a takeaway slide and I'm you know, trying to wrap up time for questions. Um, but if you just think about, well, what are these examinations about? Um, this is a pretty good inventory about what the examiners are focusing on. Again, you'll never see any of this because it's all secret. Um, but you know, it ranges from, of course, capital planning, but then also things like counterparty risk, collateral management, wholesale credit underwriting, and then down to things that it's actually sometimes hard to understand what material impact they're having on the bank's safety and soundness, but things like internal audit, um, how they manage their vendors, um, who's on their risk committees, whether they take minutes, um, things like that. But again, as examination has expanded to include every aspect of a bank's business, um, you know, I, I think that's, that's definitely why the list that you would see here. Okay, next. Okay, this is just sort of more of those um, in terms of what the priorities were. Again, I would just take this later and sort of scan it for kind of a feel for what you know, these examinations encompass. Okay, there's also questions about how do you rate banks? Um, and again, I've done some, a lot of articles on this. If you wanna Google me and uh, safety and soundness and examination, you can read all you ever wanna know. Um, interestingly, the Fed has a different rating system for the holding company than the banking agencies do for the banks. The banking agencies actually in theory have a similar rating system, which I'll get to. Uh, for the bank level examinations, but the Fed has done something different um, at the holding company. Um, the holding company, they focus you know, on three things, basically capital, liquidity, and then something they call governance and controls, which really sort of boils down to management um, and you know, is overwhelmingly the most subjective assessment. And basically, you know, does management do what we think is appropriate? Um, irrespective of whether they have a lot of capital or liquidity or whether what their earnings are. Um, you know, and I won't, I won't get any more into that. Uh, move on to the bigger topic of the CAMELS rating system. So this is kind of fun as game theory as well as regulation. Uh, so CAMELS is an acronym, Capital, Asset Quality, Management, Earnings, Liquidity, and Sensitivity. I think it's sensitivity to market risk and, and interest rate risk. Um, and then there's a one to five grading scale. Um, and then you have a composite rating, uh, which is not, as you might think, the average of those ratings, uh, individual ratings, but really completely subjective with the examiner. Now, why does your CAMELS rating system matter or your CAMELS rating matter? Um, 
you know, by law uh, to engage in certain activities, you have to have a one or two for both your composite and your management rating. Um, but then again, secretly, um, the agencies will take the position if your ratings aren't good, they will secretly prohibit you from growing, um, you know, opening branches, doing M&A, um, and you will be in the so-called penalty box. Again, you won't see any evidence of that, um, and that may last for years, um, but you know, these ratings affect that. Next slide. So again, this is a, a regulatory creation back in 1978. Um, when you think about the ratings and just do a little sort of game theory and human nature, um, in terms of the one through five, you never see a one much anymore. Not that you can see them anymore, but there are some, there's a whispers and then there are also, sometimes you see some aggregate numbers. I think actually the FDIC reports the fours and the fives. So, you know, for most banks, you know, a one indicates an examiner saying this bank is perfect and therefore being at considerable personal risk in the event that any imperfection subsequently emerges. So not a lot of reason to give a bank a one. Um, if you give them a five, you basically have to close them. So not a lot of incentive to give them a five unless they're already bankrupt. Um, a four comes with considerable regulatory um, restrictions and also is likely to provoke a reaction from the bank. So not a lot of fours. So the one to five rating system, I believe, you know, anecdotally really comes down more to a two or a three kind of rating system with a two being basically the same as a one. You can do what you want as a bank, but then a three, again, meaning you're in the penalty box. Um, you're not going to be allowed to grow. Your management's probably going to be in big trouble. Um, and basically you're on either official probation or double secret probation. Okay, next. Now, what drives those ratings? Um, again, you'll never see one of these, but the rating system or the examination report includes what are known as MRAs and MRIAs. Um, you know, I think the distinction between them is sort of lessened over time. An MRA used to be, we need you to fix this for the, over the next year or two. An MRIA means we need you to fix this right away. I think they're now both right away. Um, there's no statutory or regulatory definition of these. Um, you know, there's no prescribed penalty in statute or regulation, um, but I think banks now understand that these are not negotiable um, and that a failure to remediate them will affect your management rating and therefore your composite rating and also will certainly result in whoever the business and compliance lead is responsible for the MRA being fired. So these are sort of pseudo enforcement actions at this point, um, non-negotiable um, and mandatory. And certainly, will elevate up to the board of directors, which is one reason why if you fail to remediate it to the satisfaction of the agency, you will, you will be fired. Next. Okay, this I alluded to a little bit earlier. Um, and you should take this away later in terms of the exact law. Um, as noted, there are certain actions for which a three rating is an automatic restriction on growth. Um, the rest is are more informal secret restrictions on your ability to grow. Um, you know, if you, if you Google it, you can see that many of the large banks post 2010 were under a multi-year um, effective uh, growth ban, although it was never disclosed, it was disclosed in retrospect. So next. Okay. Um, yeah, again, these are just some of the numbers, um, which are kind of interesting, but I, I won't comment on now, but uh, the GAO does go in periodically. Um, and look at this. And again, you'll see here the focus, you know, sort of interestingly as capital and liquidity have actually become um, a much larger focus and have become more objective and quantitative. You know, most banks, most large banks are subject to at least a dozen capital requirements and a really significant liquidity requirement. Um, but so the sort of the subjective element of um, the ratings process has probably increased even as the capital and liquidity measures have become more objective. Okay, next. Um, yeah, I, I commend to you this article cited here. Um, yeah, you would you would think, you know, given the importance of these ratings, um, that it would be really important for a bank to be able to appeal a bad rating, as it has such a significant impact on its um, on its value and its ability to grow. Um, however, there are almost no cases of banks appealing. Uh, for a couple of reasons, um, one being that you're appealing to the agency that gave you the rating, uh, 
um, and the other being the potential for retaliation, which is massive. So um, you do not see hardly any, certainly at any publicly traded company, um, appeals of ratings um, to the extent that they're appealed, they are almost universally uh, denied. So I'll just do briefly enforcement actions and then try to leave a little time for questions. Um, next. So this is just a list of the types of formal enforcement actions that can occur. Um, you, you see these now predominantly with regard to anti-money laundering, which has long been a sort of point of emphasis of the banking agencies. Again, when it comes to um, you know capital liquidity, other things, um, you know, if an agency wants to take a formal action like this, it involves the ability of the bank to contest that and have a hearing on it. Whereas if they order them to do so through a confidential MRA, um, there's no, there are no process rights that attach to that. Um, so most of the uh, mandates on capital liquidity, things like that now come through the examination process rather than through any formal process where a bank would have, you know, the right to, you know, a, a public hearing um, and due process. Um, Let's see, again, you, you tend to see um, some cease and desist or, orders um, with regard to individuals um, at bars to the extent that there's an individual who misbehaves. Um, those are kind of interesting because those actually get litigated sometimes because the individual doesn't have the reputational risk of fighting with the banking agency um, or really the risk of retaliation since they've already been fired. Um, so to the extent that you see um, you know, contested actions are almost always with individuals. I knew this back in the day I used to defend SEC enforcement actions, um, which very similar story there, where the companies always settle because you can't be seen to be at war with the regulator and the potential penalties, if you lose, are so mammoth that they could, you know, be um, institution endangering. Um, but, you know, individuals, uh, particularly to the extent that they're indemnified for their legal costs, will actually fight um, and frequently win. So, sorry, digression, that's my old life. Uh, keep going. And that may be it. Um, okay. Uh, so again, just the basics of the law, um, the, the IAPs or institution affiliated parties is just, again, the ability of the agencies to bring actions against individuals who commit misconduct, um, as opposed to the, to the institution, um, you know, particularly in the, with the SEC, but also with the banking agencies, there's, you know, something of a debate about whether, you know, to the extent that, um, you know, executives at a firm caused the firm to lose a billion dollars through their malfeasance or incompetence. Um, of course, that's the shareholder's money, whether the, the penalty should be on the shareholders in the form of a fine paid by the shareholders or whether the penalty should be on the individuals um, who actually caused the shareholders to lose the money. Um, clearly, you know, at least over the last 10, 15 years, the answer has been both. Um, and then you see some of the, the grounds there. Next. And probably more than you need to know here, but um, you know, penalties are easy to understand. Civil money penalties, it's pay this fine. A cease and desist is really, um, it turns into a plan that the regulators uh, approve and then monitor. So it is, and it also results in the, inevitably in the hiring of a consultant firm, consulting firm at an incredible expense. So it's basically, you know, you have created a problem and violated how you, um, monitor transactions for with regard to the any money money laundering laws under a cease and desist authority they would a cease and desist order would say here are the 20 identified weaknesses in how you did that monitoring you are required over the next three months to come up with a comprehensive plan to remediate all those problems um, you are required to submit that plan to the agency for its approval in its discretion once the um, plan is approved um, the agency will monitor that, and then, you know, over the next, you know, one to five years, we will decide whether, in fact, you have remediated satisfactorily. At that point, the order is lifted. Um, the existence of the order is significant in the sense that, um, again, as part of the penalty box, that is probably going to be a significant restriction on the ability of the bank uh, to grow or expand. Um, although that's not really provided for in statute, um, that is certainly the, the operating uh, theory. This is a tease for Bank Regulation 101 Part 2. If I were more clever, we would have a trailer for that, um, but we do not. Um, maybe next time. So I think I have actually managed to leave 
three minutes for questions, reactions, whatever you like. Um, so let me stop there. But before I before that, just thank you for joining. Um, we would love feedback. Um, it's really tough doing this without being able to see your smiling or frowning faces um, or read the room in any other way. We cannot wait, and I hope that will be summer or fall, to do this again in person, um, chat with you in the halls. We realize it's easier to ask questions in the hallways. Um, so, you know, please stay tuned. We want to do this again in a, in a more fun way and engaging way. So let me stop there. And John, I think there was a question for you from one of our guests, uh, which asked, do you expect states to increasingly approve special licenses to tech companies entering the banking sphere? Can you give an example of a special license that has been approved and briefly talk about how it was structured? Uh, yes, yeah, so probably the best example, there, there are many examples. There are the state charters that are being developed and Wyoming is the furthest along. They have recently approved two well, they enacted a law in 2019 that allows for a new special purpose depository institution charter. As I said, this charter, I think, was is designed for crypto exchange companies, so companies that allow uh, customers to buy and sell crypto assets through their platform. Um, uh, two companies, one called Kraken Financial, another called Avanti Bank and Trust, um, were recently approved for these new special purpose depository institution charters in Wyoming. The, um, the licensee will be allowed to accept deposits, um, although they commit to not accept retail deposits, mean, or, or as they stated, they will only accept deposits from accredited investors, which is a securities law term for a relatively sophisticated investor that doesn't need a lot of consumer protections um, provided by the SEC. So presumably here, this type of depositor, if it's a large depositor, maybe they don't need any of the protections that are intended um, for, for depositors of, of ordinary banks. Th those charters have been approved. I don't think those banks have opened yet, but they certainly have their charters. They will not, they'll accept deposits, but not be FDIC insured. They will not be banks for purposes of the Federal Bank Holding Company Act. There will be no federal banking supervision or regulation of the licensed entity or the parent holding companies or any non-bank affiliates. ILCs also have been approved recently, Square, Nelnet. We think Rakuten will get an approval soon. Um, and I think PayPal will be applying soon for an ILC. I, um, based on public comments their CEO has made. Uh, so I, I see two other questions, which I'll do, I'll, I'll answer quickly. Um, so first is, do you see the CFPB taking a more direct role in supervising fintechs and under administration? Um, one never knows, but I suspect yes. Um, it's actually interesting to note, you know, the same consumer financial protection laws that apply to banks, you know, Equal Credit Opportunity Act, Truth in Lending, Truth in Savings also apply to non-banks. Uh, traditionally, the banks were much more subject to enforcement because they had on-site examiners looking at them. Uh, but one of the ideas behind the CFPB was no, we, we should have the same agency looking across the board. Um, and you know, whereas you know, the, the CFPB is potentially a second set of eyes with regard to banks or the only set of eyes with regard to non-banks um, here. And it's hard to imagine there not being a greater focus on that, uh, especially given you know, some of the things that are going on out, on out in the market. Uh, good question on supervisory gui guidance. Um, there's been a whole series of decisions from the General Accounting Office, um, you know, issuances from banking agencies about is guidance binding? Um, guidance in law is not binding. That's why it's called guidance. It's not gone through APA notice and comment rulemaking. Um, it's also required um, to be submitted to the co Congress under the Congressional Review Act, which it generally is not. The GAO has found in several occasions that things that were not, or, or guidance that was not submitted, therefore has no binding effect. The agencies have acknowledged that it has no binding effect. But again, back to that examination process, um, I think it's fair to say that most of the guidance is still being enforced by the agencies as binding rules. Um, and even to the extent that they are not explicitly doing that, uh, bank compliance departments have been trained to consider them as binding rules. Um, so. Whereas now you may not see an MRA citing, you know, paragraph six of our guidance as um, the basis for the MRA, you can bet that if you're not in compliance with six, you know, paragraph six, you're going to need to explain why, um, and you may get an MRA, and then, you know, if you want to remediate the MRA, you might want to give a look at paragraph six. But this is an ongoing debate, um, and you know, I think you know, Vice Chair Qualls at the, at the Fed has been engaged on this, and they continue to be. Um, this is a very live issue. Of course, on some level, banks like guidance because they know what the rules are. 
Um, but on the other hand, they don't really get a chance to, to comment on it. So you kind of want to be able to shape the rules and that's sort of what the APA and the constitution are about. Um, and it looks like uh, Greg and or John, we have one last question from a guest. Why can non-banks such as credit unions advertise themselves as offering banking services? All you, John. Um, well, the credit unions uh, enjoy a special status under federal law. They, they are not banks, it's correct. I mean, they're just structured differently. They have uh, members, not shareholders. The members are typically their customers and the depositors. Um, they also enjoy special status under the U.S. tax laws, meaning they don't pay any taxes. Um, uh, like most carve-outs, statutory and regulatory carve-outs for organizations that sort of quack like a bank but aren't regulated like a bank, um, Historically, there was a very sensible one for credit unions, and, and I think one could argue it's still sensible. But what, the only thing that's different, though, is that a lot of credit unions, they're, they're morphing from what they used to be and what justified their special status into something very different. Um, some of them are getting quite large and looking and functioning more and more just like ordinary banks. Um, and so the, there would probably be an argument to consider whether um, those larger ones that really are acting more like banks and less like credit unions whether they should in fact be subject to bank-like regulation. And I also say this is a live issue with regard to the state charters. So for example, one of the Wyoming institutions advertises itself um, as, as having reserves um, to, in order to make people more comfortable with depositing money there. Um, in banking, reserves means money on reserve at the Federal Reserve Bank, um, which is the most liquid, low-risk asset one can possibly imagine. Um, what the Wyoming Bank meant by reserves is a pool of assets, um, you know, like, you know, you know fixed income securities, um, which can go up or down in value. Um, so to us, at least deeply misleading, but it shows that all these terms, you know, what's a deposit, what's a banking service, what's a, what's a reserve is very much in play now. Again, it's an area where I think the CFPB will probably need probably likely play a role, maybe the FTC as well, um, maybe other regulators as well. Great, I think we're a little bit over. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who attended. Um, again, I just wanna reiterate that uh, BPI will do another uh, one of these virtual events in the spring and you'll get a survey from our events colleagues, Tracy and Whitney, please send any kind of feedback on issues you wanna deep dive into or other topics you want to cover uh, to myself and, and Greg and John are also available for any other questions that come up later. Um, thank you so much. And again, don't hesitate to reach out if there are, there are more questions. Hi. Hi.